All right, so we had a lot of good information shared today around some areas of focus and interest, and I just wanted to see if there were, um, we have about 10 more minutes, if there's any questions anybody had, or if there's any cards anybody wanted to turn in. So are we heading towards trauma-informed community, or? Is it just trauma-informed care in the healthcare profession? I would probably defer to the experts on that more, but I would say that it has to be both at, across the board. It does have to be, yeah. uh, is that a mic on? Okay, it does have to be across the board, but that has been the starting gate for it, is uh, to get trauma-informed care into healthcare organizations and into uh, human services organizations, so for example, DHS, uh, police office, uh, or sorry, police stations, that sort of thing, to recognize that trauma does exist, that it impacts how people get, uh, receive, and, and follow up with care. Yeah, well, we want to see it everywhere. We want to see it in schools. It doesn't have to be all of what we're about, but it helps us organize why things happen the way they do and helps us figure out ways to make, make it easier. So I'm curious, is anybody doing any research on virtual trauma? Because I think we, we all kind of understand, you know, real trauma that you might experience or PTSD or whatever it is. But I, I've read some things out there about the, the way kids especially are being exposed to some very traumatic uh, visual and video type of, of events. Is anybody looking at that in terms of, of whether it's creating any issues, uh, especially with children? and they see a, a traumatic event, is it having a similar effect on their, their brain makeup, their reaction to actual trauma? Actually going on since the 70s uh, as a result of television, right? Uh, exposure to violence that way. You tend to see two things. One is you see a desensitization uh, to, to violent events so people don't have the outside reactive trauma but I think where you can follow the trend is, and I'm sure you've all had this experience, we're a lot more anxious than we were 30 years ago. As a cohort, as a generation, kids are a lot more anxious than they used to be. So they may not look on the outside like they're having response to watching that really violent TV show, but their behavior becomes disorganized, their thinking becomes disorganized, they're more distractible, they have more physical symptoms. Autoimmune diseases have spiked in a really weird way over the last 20, 30 years. And I think one of the differences, we saw some of these effects 30, 40 years ago, but it wasn't always available. If you read the newspaper, if you caught the six o'clock news, you might find out about that person that you never otherwise would have heard of in Peoria who had that horrible thing happen. But now you're gonna see it 18 different times within five minutes because we are hyper-connected and it's gonna be blaring from the TV that's at the grocery store and it's gonna be blaring from the radio and and over and over. So yeah, virtual trauma and, and secondary trauma does happen. It does affect the body. And there is some research on it. Um, it's, not, it's not super solid at this time that we can predict, yes, this is the dose load that gets you that effect, but we know it happens. Yeah. I just wanted to tag on to the question about society or education. I can tell you at the state level, we are training all law enforcement prosecutors uh, throughout the state about ACEs, about the neurobiology of trauma, um, and how to interact with people, and how to obtain a history for a, from a traumatized person as opposed to a person who's there to, to get their medications refilled. And it, it is a very different totally different type of history taking. So, because that history taking when you're asking sequential questions is traumatizing in and of itself, so. Any other questions? All right, well I'm gonna ask Ellen to just give a quick plug for our Community Advisory Council, the other Ellen, sorry. <laughs> and um, talk a little bit about what the Community Advisory Council does in case anybody's interested. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, I chair the Regional Community Advisory Council. Um, we 
m even more importantly, though, we have local meetings. Dick is the chair of um, the Lynn County group, and there's a Benton County group and a Lincoln County group. And if you would like to be involved, there's a card here that you can fill out, and we'll get information to you about our local meeting. You can also get on the IHN website. It's ihntogether.org, and there's information there. And what we're working on is we're looking at any potential ways that we can help IHN CCO members from the community standpoint. Uh, we mostly want to talk to members and um, figure out ways to get out in the community and talk to members too to find out what their experience is, is and then ways that we can help them um, improve their access, their care, um, really anything. So I would like to invite all of you and um, we would love to see any of you at a meeting. I think also the Community Advisory Council has done a lot of work around engagement in our communities and community engagement and has put together some tools to be able to go out to different community settings to be able to get the word out and, and more importantly get that feedback back um, on how things are going. So that's really important. And around feedback, we have some um, feedback sheets on the table. If you could let us know what you thought of, of the presentations today and you know, what worked and what we could do differently. We're always looking for ways to improve that way in terms of reaching out with our community as well.